Welcome to Science with Soul. I'm Dr. Laurie Valentine and the host of this program. I'm a physician, evidential psychic medium, international keynote speaker, and the author of Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul. This podcast was inspired by events from my own life. And as I have journeyed through life, it has taught me that we're part of a greater divine web of interconnectedness. I have walked the path of illness, healing, and transformation, and after experiencing two near-death experiences, I became clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient, and I was guided to attend medical school at the age of 54. In this podcast, we will meet many different types of doctors, healers, spiritual leaders, educators, and other interesting souls. And it is my hope that you will gain information from this podcast to help create a path of healing your own life physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and bridge the gap between science and soul. Welcome to Science with Soul. I'm Dr. Lottie and the host of this podcast. Today, I am so excited and honored to introduce Dr. Trevor Berry, Doctor of Chiropractic and Diplomat of the American Chiropractic Neurology Board. Dr. Berry was born and raised in Alberta, Canada. He completed his pre-medicine requisites at the University of University of Calgary, and went on to complete his doctorate at Parker University in Dallas, Texas. He graduated magna cum laude salutatorian and was the recipient of many academic awards, including the Parker Scholastic Excellence Award. Upon completion of his doctorate of chiropractic, Dr. Berry attended Carrick Institute for Graduate Studies. Dr. Berry has traveled throughout North America and Europe attending neurology conferences and modules to obtain the most recent information in the field of functional neurology. He became a board certified chiropractic neurologist in 2001 upon passing the American Chiropractic Neurology Board examination. This program is the only diplomat program in the field of chiropractic that is fully accredited by the NCCA due to its rigorous standards of obtaining and maintaining diplomat status. Due to the rapidly evolving understanding of the human nervous system, Dr. Berry spends hundreds of hours every year traveling to conferences, reading peer-reviewed literature and research to stay at the cutting edge of diagnostic and treatment parameters. This is why you will find that many healthcare providers have not even heard of clinical applications and advancements in the treatments provided by functional neurologists. He has over 3,000 hours of postdoctoral education in neurological fields such as vestibular and balance disorders, traumatic brain injury, pain management and neurodegenerative disorders, as well as functional medicine. Dr. Berry has been doing FDA research on neurological effect of laser therapy since 2011. And in 2014, he received the Arconia Researcher of the Year Award. Since then, he has been hired by the Arconia Corporation as a neurology consultant and international speaker. With his background in functional medicine, Dr. Berry was hired on in 2017 by Vibrant America Diagnostic Company as a neurology consultant and lecturer. He was also brought on by the BTB Health Systems as a partner, lecturer, and consultant in 2017, and lectures nationally and internationally for topics including functional neurology, functional medicine, laboratory testing and interpretation, laser therapy, and more. <laughs> wow, that is, that is quite a resume. I'm so excited that you will be sharing your knowledge today with the listeners. So very welcome, Dr. Barry. I'm so glad to have you here. I, I am as excited as you are. I'm very honored to be part of your panel. I know you've got a great lineup, and so I'm happy to be on board. Looking forward to it. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I can't wait for you to share your knowledge. Could you start by explaining what the difference is between a functional neurologist and how, how are they different from a regular neurologist? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's one of the most common ones we get. And in, it really what it boils down to is this, is that um, 
a lot of people that suffer from neurological conditions, there are a lot of pathologies out there, you know, like certain um, you know, tumors and different things that will affect the nervous system that need medical intervention or medical management. But a, most, a good amount of our patient base doesn't actually have a disease process going on. They've got some sort of functional asymmetry or deficit or say misfiring, if you will, in their nervous system. And it could be a chemical imbalance. It could be a, a, a focal nidus where part of the brain or brainstem isn't quite working as well as it should. Just like maybe like if you had a weak muscle, um, you could do certain exercises to strengthen that muscle. Well, that kind of weakness can happen in your brain pathways as well. So where a functional neurologist is different is that we don't use medications or surgical intervention. We don't use invasive procedures because most of those types of uh, conditions that our, our general population suffers from are not amenable to those kind of interventions. So there is definitely a time and a place for that. And I work hand in hand with medical neurologists, but there, you know, when, when it comes to being able to do things um, to rehab the system, there's a lot, like there are certain conditions that, you know, you can't medicate your way into making a new brain pathway or new connection. You can't surgically, you don't want to like surgically take out parts of the brain or add parts of the brain. It's just not, you know, it's not feasible or possible <laughs> to do that. So, so that's where we come no, in. We fill a very big niche yeah. of being able to rehab the brain, just like maybe a physical therapist would or trainer for the body, but we work in that same context for the brain. Um, the brain is a receptor-based system, and that's where this, this is where we love um, you know, brain-based applications. This is why we love massage, acupuncture, chiropractic, like all these holistic modalities where you stimulate the body in certain ways because it, the old adage is what goes in dictates what comes back out. And so if you can optimize that receptor-driven system and get it all balanced out by driving different pathways and balancing the brain out, that's when, once we have a healthy brain and a balanced brain, then your body can function normally. Because as you know, the brain is the master system. So if it's working optimally and, and functionally optimally, then every, every other system has, in the body has a better chance to work well as well. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> We're just getting started. <laughs> like, di trying to digest all of that. <laughs> That's all. So... When you work with people and, you know, I get the idea that the brain is very plastic and you can sort of remodel it. It's, you know, to me, it sounds like Play-Doh and it's, you can just sort of remold it if you, if you know what you're doing. But what kind of improvements have you seen when you treat different types of patients? Like if you work with, you know, somebody who has Parkinson's disease, for example, how does that what, what can you do to, tr to help these people that they think that the only way they can get well is to take a medicine? Right. But I know you, you guys approach it very differently. Exactly. You bring up great points. That term neuroplasticity, the, the beautiful thing about brain rehab is the studies show as long as you're living and breathing, you can make new pathways. You can establish better function in the brain connections and in the brain chemistry. And if you can, as long as you have the ability to do that, then you can change the path that your brain is on, whether it's a neurodegenerative condition like an Alzheimer's, like dementia, you know, I'm, I'm going to be careful to say that I don't claim to treat any disease process. What I would, my job as a functional neurologist is to help normal adaptive physiology of the human nervous system. So by creating a, a more optimal environment and by creating new path pathways or new neuroplasticity, then what you can do is get parts of the brain working that maybe weren't working before. Um, so we'll see everything, like when you talk about different conditions that we work with and, and what kind of results we get, it may be something where you have somebody that's showing severe demise in balance or in memory recall or you know, in movement disorder stuff, like in a Parkinsonian situation where they're freezing and tremors and all these other things. And when you start to change brain mapping and, and brain firing and brain plasticity and brain chemistry, you start to get everything lined up in a more appropriate manner. So now they can start to remember things like their name, like their family member's name. And, you know, from the outside observation, somebody would look at that and say, well, you just reversed Alzheimer's like dementia, for example. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything like that. I'm not making any claims like that. All I did was get that person's brain better functional integrity so that those pathways start to fire and connect again. And mm -hmm. lo and behold, they start to remember things that they forgot, or they start to move in a way that they couldn't move or digest and have bowel movements and all these other things that we, we want for a healthy body and lifestyle. 
So it may be something where you, you actually see our cases completely reverse course. Like they went from just being on this downhill demise and they're, now they're back to doing stuff like playing tennis or doing stuff that they couldn't do before. And that would be diagnosed or that might be assessed as a reversal. Other patients, it might just be slowing down the neurodegenerative process. Like if they're on a really steep decline and their brain was really wasting and inflamed and going through cortical atrophy, like, and all these other things, it might be our job in this realm to try and slow that down by tamping down the inflammation and getting the hormones balanced and all those things that you work with as well. And so it's, it, it may, there's different layers to what success is in the neurological world. Sometimes you see complete recovery and turnaround. And, you know, this is, it brings up an interesting topic because one of the more common questions I get when I'm teaching and lecturing is, can you reverse Alzheimer's? And I love referencing Dale Bredesen out of UCLA. He's kind of like the godfather of, right. of uh, Alzheimer's research. He's been showing him really good research papers on, you know, the reversal of Alzheimer's. He's got some books out whatnot. So the way I speak, I'm right in line mm -hmm. with Dr. Bredesen on, on what, how we implement things with lifestyle strategies, with nutrition strategies, with fasting, with uh, brain-based exercises, cardiovascular stuff. But really one of the big important points for your audience is that mm -hmm. if you're going to have a healthy brain, you have to have a physician that truly takes on that holistic model that looks at all of the different moving parts how the brain is firing, what the hormones are doing, what the labs are doing. If, is the patient having leaky gut? Are there pathogens in the brain and the body and all? Yeah. You know, so you have to, I could go on for an hour just on. Right. Okay, but you, <laughs> yeah. you, have to, you have to take, and you can't be missing any of those. You, know, you have to look under every stone because you can line up 10 Alzheimer's patients of mine and they're going to have 10 different treatment protocols. Yes, there's certain common denominators that we may use on each one, but I also think it's important for healthcare providers, and you do this as good as anyone, mm -hmm. is take that individual and treat them as an individual. And because one of my Alzheimer's patients, it may do, be due to pathogens like Epstein-Barr in the brain or something, and the next one's due to you know, a diabetic issue with blood sugar utilization and, and bad diet. And so your treatment plan, you know, even though they may both present in a very similar fashion with dementia-like symptoms, the treatment plans for those cases is completely different. So that individuality of care is really important in neurological activity. Wow, it sounds very different from the traditional route going to a regular neurologist. His, I mean, not that I work in neurology, but the experience that I've had um, with family members or, or patients it's more, it seems that it's more, this is the protocol, this is the medicine we give you, but it, when they go to a functional neurologist, it's very different because you, you look at all the different pieces that could be contributing to that problem. So that's just amazing that, you know, you guys are, are you're like uh, the holistic uh, neurologist that right. takes all the different, you know, pieces into account into treating that individual. Um, I know that you do something called a mirror therapy and, and, and the patient looks in the mirror and then somehow that it, it tricks the brain and they think they're moving the other parts of the body. Can you explain when, when would you use something like that and how does that work? Yeah, well, and I'll, first I'll differentiate because there's a part of your brain that uh, there's areas of your brain that have mirror neurons. And those are used therapeutically as well. Like when a baby is watching their parent smile or frown, the baby's likely to emulate those, you know, emotional expressions and whatnot. Those, and it's also for feed forward stuff. Like when you're visualizing maybe a movement, like an athlete about to take a shot or something, there's mirror neurons, but mirror therapies is where we, where we actually take a mirror and we cover maybe a damaged limb. Say they've had a stroke and they can't use their right arm anymore what we'll do as part of our therapeutic interventions, we'll cover that arm with a mirror. So, and the patient looks at it. And so when they're looking in the mirror, you position the mirror so that it's actually reflecting on the good limb, say their left arm that can still move well. So then what you do is as they're looking in the mirror, the brain thinks it's the damaged right arm, but it's actually the left arm. And you have the patient start to do movement patterns and the brain starts going, holy cow, my right arm is working. <laughs> And then it starts to devote pathways and attention and plasticity and whatnot. And you start to do a whole algorithm like we do passive assisted motion and we do, um, you know, co-activation and eye exercise, all these things, vagal stimulation. We do all these different things to start to reboot the system. 
and get those pathways working again that may have been you know, damaged and dormant. As stroke is a good example, but it can be used in complex regional pain syndrome or what used to be reflex sympathetic dystrophy, where the patient does not want to move that limb. It hurts even just the blow on the limb, you know, or right. you, God forbid you touch that limb. Right. At you. Um, another good one that we use it for is phantom limb syndrome. You know, uh, hey, you know, say somebody's lost a limb, maybe an IED in Afghanistan, or, you know, something like that, where they don't actually have the limb anymore, but they feel pain because pain is centralized. It's a central experience. So you can do rehab with, with phantom limb syndrome, with movement disorders. Like I get a lot of professional musicians that fly in to maybe they've developed some you know, weird finger pattern because they're a cello player and they're you know, playing in a symphony and they can't move their fingers how they're supposed to. We'll use mirror therapies for that. Um, another one like frozen shoulder and other orthopedic conditions, you can use it. So there's a broad range that you can use mirror therapies and it is kind of a neat adjunct to have. I love yeah. teaching that. Because it, you know, it's kind of it's a really interesting way to stimulate the brain and get it thinking. Oh, that I can move that, <laughs> right. limb, or I can move it without hurting. So, yeah, it's, it's just fascinating how it, you know you can do because it it's so simple, and right. and still it it tricks the brain into thinking that that limb is actually working, because it's because exactly. the the body is seeing it and it, it's just amazing. Um, what are your uh, favorite treatment modalities and why? Well, I think yours might be mirror therapy, so I'll throw that in. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I love, you know, um, it's kind of interesting, our bag of tricks. Like what we, if you followed us around our office, you, a lot of people that don't know what we're doing to stimulate the different parts of the brain might think that we're off our rocker, you know, just because we do so many different things because we're trying to, some may, maybe it's the visual cortex, so we're doing visual evoke potentials. Maybe we're doing eye exercises, like the Carrick eye exercises and eye movement stuff. Maybe it's a vestibular, you know, head positioning maneuver that's activating the vestibular system or doing like rotational therapies. Um, so I just use, I'll use chiropractic adjustments, very powerful neurological tool. I'll work hand in hand with acupuncturists to bring up different parts of the brain for the central integration or massage, stretching. We love soft tissue work. But I, I think probably one of the big ones, and this is a, an area that's kind of very near and dear to me, is low level laser therapy. Yeah, that that modality might be the most important add-on that I've added, not just as a practitioner, but definitely in the field of neurology. And I know we'll we'll branch out more into low-level laser therapy and in, in all of its applications, but that is definitely one of the biggest add-ons. So I just think it's important that that you know my favorite things is that being being able to test and understand that if it's more of a chemical profile look at advanced specialty tests, you know, look at autoimmune testing and food sensitivity testing and all these things that might be inflaming the brain or causing autoimmune conditions is that the standard medical model tends to fall short on the testing. They're not looking under that stone. So the patient may not know that maybe it's gluten that's attacking their own brain, or maybe it's, mm -hmm. maybe it's something more benign like spinach. They just have an, but they've tagged right. an antigen and now they think they're eating healthy. And every time they are there, it's actually inflaming their brain and their body. So, um, and so, and molecular mimicry is a big one with that too, on how things get into our body that might be a pathogen or a food and your immune system tags it as such, but if part of your body tissue looks the exact same or very similar to it, your immune system gets tricked into attacking your own body. And now you and I are seeing in practice, right. well, there's upwards of 100 autoimmune conditions, and whether practitioners know it or not, that's in their office every day. So you have to be able to assess the labs, you have to be able to change chemistry profiles, and you have to be able to activate the brain. Because as complex as all this stuff is, the nervous system is really based on two fundamental principles. It's based on fuel delivery and activation. And if you have both of those in place, if you're getting the right substrate and chemistry and oxygen and blood flow to the brain, and the brain is activating the proper way, then you're, that's going to give it the best environment. You can't be short on either one of those because you could have all the right ingredients of the cake, but if you don't have the oven to bake it, well, right. it's not going to be any good and vice versa. You can have the oven, but not the right ingredients of the cake. So, so it's important to have all those tools in your repertoire. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a lot. <laughs> let, let, the, let the audience take a breath after right. that one. I'll, I'll try and come <laughs> up with something out of brevity. I'll like a one word <laughs> answer. I'll try and say yes or no. To one of the no, <laughs> but you, you're so knowledgeable. You have so much information to share. Um, 
just trying to let the, the audience digest as they're listening to this because there's so much information. You know, I, I'm a physician and it takes, you know, po- my brain power to follow along with everything you're throwing out there. So it's a lot for uh, people to digest when they're listening. Um, what, um, with a practice specializing in neurology, uh, what are some of the newer concepts being addressed to protect and repair the brain? Oh, I love that question. Yeah, because there's so much we know, like the, the field of neurology, even from five years ago, has evolved to a point where it's a whole different paradigm of how we're going after, especially brain-based conditions. I think the first one I would start with is your barrier systems, your, your blood-brain barrier and your tight junction barrier of your gut. Because if those barrier systems get disrupted, look out. And it starts right from, you know, a lot of your audience, a lot of your practitioners work with neonates and family care and stuff, you know, cesarean section versus vaginal delivery and the mom's microbiome and breastfeeding as long as we can to develop those barrier systems and not exposing the baby to toxins early on. And, you know, that brings up like the vaccine dilemma and all these other topics like that. But barrier systems are, our barrier systems are getting disrupted. Um, stress, chemicals, environmental chemicals, poor brainstem tone, poor vagal, like your, that part of your brain that's, we have this autonomic nervous system that's the part that we don't think about. Like we don't have to think about our heart rate and our bowel movements and our lungs and all that happens automatically. It's the autonomic nervous system. Our population worldwide, especially right now in 2020, we're in a fight or flight mode <laughs> more than ever. And we need to be- The entire a, world. <laughs> right, exactly. We need to be in more of a resting, digesting mode. So that brings up the, so the barrier systems are predicated on a lot of that's based on having proper resting, digesting. Uh, but when those barrier systems are disrupted, things get into our body and into our brains that shouldn't be in there. So another new concept that, you know, as part of your question is what we're seeing a lot of in brains of neurodegenerative stuff is bug, like pathogens, like viruses and bacteria and all these little critters getting into the brains. And that's actually setting off that all of the cascades, like the plaque buildup and the tangles and the inflammation of the brain, that's all your hallmark stuff for neurodegeneration. That could actually be due to pathogens getting in the brain, like viruses. Um, another big one we're doing a lot of that's kind of a newer concept, even though it's been around in certain realms, is vagal nerve stimulation. That vagus nerve that runs from your brainstem to all those different parts, all the way down your colon, the splenic flexor of your colon, that vagal nerve stimulation can be used in autoimmune conditions, cardiac conditions, septicemia, like inf- infections of the body, uh, neurodegeneration conditions, stroke rehab, traumatic brain injury. Like just one small example of if you, like almost every patient we're seeing that has a traumatic brain injury develops leaky gut. That's, we're seeing that almost blankly across the board. But if you can do vagal nerve stimulation within six hours of a traumatic brain injury, you can actually save the gut lining and, and actually help with that. And I, a good clinical gem for all of your audience is to start to look into the realm of fasting intermittent fasting and working up to like full day fast and even three day water fast because fasting is a really good simple free easy tool that your audience can use to help get inflammation down help repair the barrier systems repair the gut um, reset the immune system and whatnot now there's always going to be exceptions to the fasting rule but as a general rule um, you're hearing more people talk about like 16, eight eating where you only eat for eight hours of the day and you don't eat for 16 hours and concepts like that are very foundational and fundamental to a healthy brain and healthy body. So the more you can give your body a good environment to clean up the garbage, especially your brain, it gets a chance to kind of get the inflammation down and take out the garbage and get all the bad stuff out of there. <laughs> you know, these fancy terms like autophagy and mitophagy. And the other interesting thing about fasting like laser is it makes new brain pathways. It actually forms new pathways to make your system more efficient and you know, better cognitive reserve and better brain function. So those are, those are some of the you know, neat things. The low level laser is definitely on that list. That's, that's one of the really cutting ed, uh, edge nascent fields that we're in that we're exploring heavily right now. Um, and then you know, even getting into back into that realm, and I know we're gonna you know, definitely diverge into this topic is the, the, the psychedelics. You know, some of the stuff that we're seeing in in addiction and recovery and uh, PTSD and whatnot, that to me is a very exciting realm. I'm glad that we're bringing it back to research and whatnot, because it got, as you know, they got chased out of here in the you know, late 60s, 70s, and we've lost the 30 plus years of what should have been great research on this stuff, because it's amazing 
what these plant-based medicines can do in the classic psychedelics. But I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of things here. So right. let, it's okay. let me let the audience breathe again. I'll take a step right. back. <laughs> <laughs> so go back and talk a little bit about the, the low level, level laser therapy. Um, how is that being used by integrated practitioner? I know you talked about it can actually make new pathways. What else does low level laser therapy do for the patient? Well, as a break, well, I'll start with the peripheral stuff. Like we have these level one FDA clearances for all your pain management stuff, like back pain and neck pain and shoulder pain and you know all. So you can use health. the laser for like back pain and neck Everything. pain. As a matter of fact, I was the principal investigator for a, a level one FDA study or level one FDA clearance um, on chronic low back pain, and so it can be used in all body situations. But we're seeing there's over ten thousand five hundred papers on low level laser. And we're seeing it used in lipid panel issues, in, in inflammation issues, in autoimmune conditions, in thyroid regulation, in uh, pathogens. We're seeing lasers as a really good defense against pathogens in the body, being able to take out viruses and bacteria. Like the lasers I use have been shown, and the, those laser parameters have been shown to take out things like MRSA, you know, like flesh-eating staph and, and Epstein-Barr virus and all these other viral loads that, that it's a really interesting like, and I, I don't want to get too deep down the COVID-19 <laughs> path, but right. I was just going to say, could we just use this for COVID too? Like, when, and, let's and, just get this into the hospitals now. <laughs> right, exactly. No, now for the medical legal side, I'm going to say you were not treating COVID SARS-CoV-2, but if you look at the evidence, you can see what the foundation, why it can be used in RNA-based replication, but like those viruses like, like COVID, that's an RNA-based replication. Um, as, uh, as well as things that will inhibit uh, RNA replication like zinc and N-acetylcysteine and uh, you know, your resveratrol products and different things like that. Even melatonin has been shown to have. So there's all these things that you can get into with pathogens that will help inhibit RNA replication and even protect like a big one is your mucosal lining, your Sig A, eat your veggies, your vitamin A. But uh, vitamin D is the most important thing of all this discussion. You know, we're seeing linear correlation between if you get this pathogen with vitamin D levels and how severe your suffering is based on your vitamin D levels. But I digress. So the lasers <laughs> uh, going up into the brain and more in my wheelhouse is it's based on the fact that the brain, if you can increase energy output, great. Well, the lasers increase the powerhouse of the cells of the brain, the mitochondria. Not only does it increase the output of that powerhouse, it actually promotes new mitochondrial formation or biogenesis. It will protect your RNA and DNA from damage. It will protect your brain and actually research is showing even reverse that placking that happens in the brain and the tangles that happen on the inside of the neuron. It actually protects against those, which are your hallmark neurodegeneration, and even the cells exploding, the apoptosis, like what happens in degeneration, stroke and whatnot. If you laser the brain, you help protect against that, the spreading effect of that. Um, inflammation of the brain. I, just that alone, I could stop on that topic, is that lasers are one of your best ways to turn that inflammation cycle off. We need inflammation in certain situations, but what most of our, my population or patient base is suffering from is chronic inflammation. And so we have to be able to, to put a fire hose onto the brain, turn off the inflammation of the brain as we look for the other sources. Maybe it's leaky gut, food-based, maybe it's excess sugar, whatever. You know, we, we can go back down that road. But um, antioxidant activity lasers to the brain will help with like glutathione like your free radical damage lasers will protect against that just like your superfoods will like your berries and things like that that are really good antioxidants glutathione you know the mother of all antioxidants uh catalase all those glutathione all those antioxidant systems are helped with that um all your new growth factors you you had talked about like making new pathways well lasers will promote that um lasers will they're, they're almost too good to be true when i teach i'm like if if everyone on the planet knew what red low level laser does to the brain, everyone would be getting laser. The pro like if everyone, if those things were done by a nutraceutical or a new, like a, a supplement, everyone on the planet would be taking that supplement. If a medication did all the stuff red lasers do, everyone would be on that medication. The only reason why not everyone's doing this laser stuff is that no, nobody knows about it or not enough people know about it. So that's part of my mission is to get that information out. There's only one caveat, and that's the biggest misconception with lasers is that while all this laser stuff is good, then more laser must be better. And that's not true. There's a very distinct hormetic curve, like a bell curve, 
that you want to be on low level, low dose laser. And that's why I attached my car to the Arconia horse. Cause when I was doing all my research, I realized that they were perfectly situated to be the best true laser company on the market. That was in that nice low milliwatt dose. That's perfect for brain, especially for me, for protecting my daughters um, from neurodegeneration. That's why I really started researching this and diving deep into this. I wanted to find the most effective and safest low level laser to use on their brains and that, and that just spawned into this, you know, what it is today with doing all this brain-based research. So. so if I'm understanding you correctly, there's a lot of different laser therapies out there. And if you go to conferences, you know, as a physician, we see a lot of different kinds of lasers and um, different salespeople trying to, you know, show us and their product is always the best one. Right. So what is the difference between the ones you're using and all the other lasers that are on the market? Well, just a contrast, like the ones I use, the, the diodes, the power output is, is either seven and a half or 17.5 milliwatts, milliwatts. A lot of these class four lasers are up over 25 watt lasers. And those lasers can cause thermal damage. They can cause apoptosis from excess calcium influx into the neurons. They can cause valence electron activity. They can even cause cancers. So, you know, our first job as physicians, I would say is do no harm. And and as the literature keeps pouring in on lasers, that the, these higher powered lasers, they only have FDA clearance through substantial equivalents as a heat lamp. They don't actually have clearance as a laser. The Arconia has actually a photobiomodulation, photochemical clearance, because it's actually doing what you want lasers to do. So a lot of times these high powered lasers kind of use that rhetoric of, well, if this low level is good, ours is better because it's higher powered, it's deeper penetrating, it's blah, blah, blah. They don't have any studies to back them up. And if you look at the PubMed stuff, not only does it not back them up, you start to see more and more that it actually could potentially cause damage to tissues. So in just simple terms, the, the, the areas with the highest metabolic function, like the highest energy function, like your brain, your heart, your gonads, things like that, requires the like, least amount of photochemical energy. So low level is good. That's why one of the top researchers in the industry, Hamblin, used to be at higher power lasers. He actually attached his cart over to the far bottom end of the, the low dose of red light therapy. So, you know, the people that are in the know really know that they want to be down at that low level dose, especially for brain based stuff. So definitely not all created equal. Unfortunately, I wish I could say that because I don't want to sit here and bash different companies or whatever. But you also have to make sure the audience knows and my patients know that this is what the research shows. So that's why I've heavily vetted all these different companies. And that's why I, I definitely like the low level Arconia products. So. Oh, that's, that's great information because there is so many different products out there and uh, not knowing where to start or why you're speaking of, of this particular laser company, Arconia. Um, and, but you've done a lot of research and really dug deep into it. Um, so that's, as an audience, I would be super appreciative of, of all that information. What are uh, some of the keys to maintaining a healthy brain? Ooh, I love that. Um, well, it starts with your lifestyle. I mean, I, I don't think it's any secret that unfortunately as a, as a collective whole, as a country, we don't, we don't move enough. We don't exercise enough. And like I said earlier, we're receptor driven systems. So the more you exercise, the more you fire pathways to make your brain stronger. And I love all forms of exercise, but definitely novelty and complex movements like Tai Chi and yoga. Um, and like even one thing I should mention is like meditation is actually a really good thing for brain. Like studies show that meditation actually forms gray matter in your hippocampus, which is like that memory center of archiving your thoughts and, and memories. That, that hippocampus is where dementia starts. Well, you can meditate, exercise, laser, I'll do all these really good things to actually promote new gray matter in that area. But I think movement is a big one. Um, communication is a big one. Being socially active. Like, don't be Howard Hughes. You want to be out, <laughs> you know, you want to be out talking and staying like the nun study and being with your, you know, whatever groups, support group, church groups, you know, whatever that is and staying socially active. Um, learning new things like art and music. Music therapies are phenomenal for the brain. Um, so those kind of things. Um, and then eating well. Like Americans, we eat sugar. We're carb addicts. We got to get rid of that. Like a lot of researchers call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes for a reason. Mm -hmm. 
because the more carbs we have, the more our brain gets inflamed, the more clacking it has, things like that. That's not the only cause of it, but it is a big one in this country. And we're talking over 100 million Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic now. So uh, that's one of the first things you want to look for is getting away from the standard American diet or the SAD diet and moving right. towards good, healthy fats and proteins. Now, I will cycle patients through ketosis, but um, I really think the audience should just, I, when people say, well, what's the best diet? I, I say the mother nature diet. And they look at me cross-eyed. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> I've never heard of the mother nature diet. I say, well, what did mother nature put on our planet for us to eat? She gave us, you know, wild caught fish, grass fed, um, you know, meat sources, uh, we want plants. We don't eat enough veggies. We want good, but we want organic. Mother Nature did not give us genetically engineered food treated with Roundup. Like that's not <laughs> our, our immune system and our guts are going, what is this? And it actually, you know, the genetically engineered stuff and glyphosates and all that stuff that that actually is creating leaky gut stuff. That's what studies are showing. So yeah, we want to stay as organic and natural as possible. And when you have that kind of dietary lifestyle and not a bunch of chemical exposure, I should probably mention things like EMF, like radiation exposure and all these other toxic things. But if we eat well and we move well and we're doing yoga and Tai Chi and exercise, cardio, and then throwing fasting on top of that, that's a really good recipe for a healthy brain. That's very good advice. It's because the mother earth did give us what we need to eat. It didn't exactly. give us things... Yeah. I, I usually tell my patient, if it comes in a bag or a box, don't eat it. Right. You know, you want to eat what's, what's fresh. Um, how does spirituality fit into your treatment paradigm? Uh, I love this because I, I go science, 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 science in my seminar. And then right at the end of Saturday night, when everyone's exhausted from all this neurology, I hit them with things like ayahuasca and, and ibogaine and, you know, psilocybin and all that. And they're looking at me like, What? Um, and, but really it should be mainstream. It shouldn't be, you know, the, the spirituality, you know, obviously that comes in many different definitions and forms, but, uh, you know, I think to have a healthy body, you have to be, you can't just be physically sound, but not have good chemical makeup. But spirituality is the next of that, of that pillar of health to have a healthy, uh, spiritual balance and connection. That's really important. Now there's different cultures and different um, trainings can bring you into that spiritual realm in different ways. Some people use breathing exercises, yoga is, you know, in essence, prepping you for that and whatnot. But one of the most fascinating areas for me has been the dimethyltryptamine and the classic psychedelics that can take you into that spiritual realm um, and, and, and allow you to have that, that spiritual experience. I know, you know, obviously this topic for you with your background and history with your near death experience is one of the most transformational things for me was sitting in ayahuasca. And when I did that, you know, it, they call it the soul vine or the God vine, or you'll hear t different terms like that, because it, in, in oversimplified terms, it kind of allows you to have a near death experience without dying on a hospital bed or getting <laughs> run over by a car. Now going through it, you may feel like you're getting run over by a car. I'm just going to warn the audience right now. It is not an easy journey. So I don't say this lightly, you know, I'm really careful about set and setting and controlled environment and, you know, being with the right shaman and all those different factors. So, and keeping in mind, this is a schedule one substance in the United States. So <laughs> I know, thankfully we're seeing with the election and like, you know, can't cannabis becoming decriminalized. And I think that's great. I think it was such a, a ridiculous notion to have this war on drugs and, and have a marijuana offense of, you know, somebody holding a half an ounce of that. I, I never understood that. We wasted a lot of taxpayer money on that, but that allows us, and I'll, I'll mention maybe on that, I, um, the cannabis, the CBD stuff is that's a really important tool that you can use for the brain and immune function. Whatnot. CBD and ca cannabinoids are kind of a mother, one of mother nature's homeostatic devices. If your system's too low, it'll help bring it up. If your system's too high, it'll help calm it down. So CBD is kind of one of those, we use that extensively in our office, whether it's medical marijuana, topical CBDs, different things like that. There's different issues with dose and absorption and sourcing because cannabis is poorly absorbed. We only get about a 19% at best absorption of it. So a lot of times when people take it orally, like an Amazon version or something like, well, it didn't do anything for me. Well, there's a good chance you just didn't get enough of a dose. You want like, mm -hmm. you know, 25 milligrams, things like that. But anyway, back to the, the spiritual thing, I think to have that um, spiritual is just as important, if not more important as the physical and chemical balance, because you can't be, you know, in a, in a, 
bad psychological state and expect to have a healthy brain. You know, you, you, you and I both see it all the time in practice. Yeah patients suffering from all these symptoms and then they go to the beach in Maui for a week and all those symptoms are gone. You know, right. wasn't some magical power in the Maui beach. Well, no, I yeah. mean, they just got their psychology calmed down and their stress levels down and that kind of falls under that umbrella. And so um, I think it is important. And I, I love how they're bringing that, the whole psychedelic realm back into mainstream. Like I, the way I bridge the gap to go from that scientific to the spiritual realm in my seminars is talk about, for example, opiate addictions and other addictions that are killing are like, it's the number one cause of death under the age of 50 preventable death is, is addiction stuff from, from even prescription opiates. And it's skyrocketing again during the COVID, the, the quarantine lockdown we're seeing this, you know, after 2017, we were starting to see the opiate addiction, right. go down, but now it's skyrocketing again and, and alcoholism and all these other things. So, Things like ibogaine and ayahuasca can reset the default mode network, which is the circuitry in the brain that kind of gets you stuck and perseverating and stuck in an ego way that you, you in those addictive things. Well, it actually breaks that default mode network in oversimplified terms and works with your salience network to hit a reset button. And there are lots of documented cases and cases of people that were severely addicted to heroin or prescription opiates or whatnot, and they do one week or even one ceremony with something like ayahuasca, and they are completely free of the addiction. That's how powerful it is. And it was really started by like Johns Hopkins and Stanford and Harvard and whatnot. They're getting into high dose psilocybin, the magic mushroom thing for cancer patients. Because if you, if you go through that experience and you find God, so to speak, um, and again, that can be played out in different ways, but it happened in my first ayahuasca thing and in getting into that experience, once you're, if you have the opportunity, if you're blessed with that, that experience, your outlook on life and death completely changes. The fear of death has gone. And that's why every, like what 70, like the in journal of psychopharmacology, they said 70% of the people that took one major dose of psilocybin it was the most transformational spiritual thing. And they were completely at ease with what was waiting on the other side, so to speak. And how beautiful is that to be able to go through life saying, you know what, I'm going to enjoy every minute, every year I have on this planet, but I'm also, you know, if it's my time tomorrow or the next day or 10 years from now, so be it. I'm, I'm ready for that. And as, as a matter of fact, I welcome that. And how good of a place to be is that spiritually? That it's just amazing. Cause it's, it's almost like, We've missed the train because our our whole you know society is just driven by the pharmaceutical companies and 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 money and there's no money nobody's going to fund the research on plant medicine because they can't make money on it they can't patent it and so they can't own it because it, it belongs to the earth and so there's no money in it so it's like it, our whole healthcare system is just driven by greed in, in a certain way, you know, granted there's a lot of pharmaceuticals that are great and they serve a purpose in our society, but um, it's sad that we can't have more research on natural products and plant medicine and what that can do for patients. You know, we need to come up with funding for that somehow. I um, love it. To, yeah, you know, I, to provide, you know, because we can have more research that so we, you know, this is such a great option for many patients and many people could get well, if, you know, so from all many, these other treatment yeah. modalities. You hit, so you hit the nail on the head. It, it's really so it's almost going to have to be a grassroots because we're failing our, say, PTSD patients so miserably with the standard mm -hmm. Western model. You know, these patients are not getting better on SSRIs and different things like that. And yet you turn around and you expose them to MDMA, which is a street name of like ecstasy or Molly. So it's got this taboo mm -hmm. stigma attached to it. If you go to maps.org and you see they're on, on uh, you know, level three studies of, of showing how beneficial the outcomes are on PTSD with MDMA or ecstasy, it's knocking it out of the park. So yeah. I'm hoping coming in kind of backdooring it that way drives the interest say we have to help our people whether it's our military our first responders or whatever yeah and there's lots of forms yeah. of ptsd and whatnot you could be in a car accident and have ptsd so i hope that drives it and i hope that grassroots and the you know interest and and whatnot and and even from the voting perspective that drives it you know to legalize it like i see a lot of states are trying to legalize mushrooms you know 
I think Oregon was passing it. Yeah. Uh, I think Montana, I think there's a few states that are, are mm -hmm. looking to get it passed. And Colorado, I guess, is a good example. And so it's great that we're seeing it, at least from, from the bottom up approach, because you know it's not going to come from the, the top down. Approach. Right. The powers that be, the special interests yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, it's so needed. And, you know, just getting the marijuana legalized in the state of Arizona before we could only prescribe it for seven, I think it was seven conditions. And there's so many people that actually benefit from that and, and they don't tolerate the regular Western medicine. And this is an alternative for these people, just like psilocybin and, and ayahuasca and all these other treatment modalities. But it's a matter of, of making it legal in some way so that, so that people who need it can actually access it. And open up the door for research too. Once it's legal yeah. off that schedule one, now you're going to see more and more people researching these things and getting, looking at these amazing outcomes that no other pharmaceutical has. And to your point, you know, they'll try and attach a synthetic molecule to it, but every time man attaches a synthetic molecule, yeah. especially brain chemistry, that's where I get yeah. scared. Anytime you start to mess with brain chemistry, you know, a good example is willow bark. You know, it's great. You know, you can do it and your body tolerates it well, but you attach and turn it into aspirin with the acetyl group, well, now all of a sudden it's ripping a hole in your stomach. You're right. You know, <laughs> bleeds and stuff. So yeah, we, we, you know, Mother Nature does things well, and, it, and mushrooms are yeah. a good example of that. You talk about one of Mother Nature's best gifts to humankind. Um, every, I hope your audience reads everything you can from like Paul Stamets' work and, and people like that that are the experts in the mushroom world and and how effective they can be. The beta glute, like 1316 beta glucan, cancer stuff, immune regulation stuff, even new pathway formation, BDNF stuff like we've been talking about. So yeah, you get to, uh, there's there's a lot of un uncharted waters in this realm and I'm excited to just be you know opening those floodgates. So. That's awesome. How, how can healthcare providers get more information regarding this type of integrative neurological rehab I think, um, well, because my approach has been taken from some of my top mentors, you know, the, the Ted Carricks of the world, the, the Tis Karazians, the, um, you know, Dan Murphy is like, so I take a, I, a lot of the good functional neurologists. I love the Carrick Institute work. You know, they, they've done amazing work. Functional med, there's a lot, the IFM group and the, uh, you know, the, the Karazian Institute and, and those groups, there's some, and it goes way beyond that. Trust me. I'm just kind of mentioning a couple of names, low level laser. That's kind of been my baby, um, to put it all together in one practice. You know, they can definitely go to the website, our website, uh, the, the www.azchironeuro.com. And you can kind of start to see information about how much we put it all, it all together. Um, so that, that would be one way I would just say for the audience, like, Try and find a practitioner um, like you can go to like you and I have been talking about, like for the functional neurologist, ACNB.org is, is showing all the board certified uh, functional neurologists worldwide. And you can do a doctor locator search. If you go to Ericonia.com, you can find doctors that are using the laser. Um, and then there's you know other other groups like that. So they exist out there. I, I try and find people that do it all. Like you do the functional med, you do the functional neuro, you do the laser, but you'll hear me teach in my seminars. Look, if you're not going to do functional med in your practice, that's fine, but make sure you're referring to somebody like you that is doing that stuff so that you can handle the hormone imbalances and the, you know, or the acupuncture or, you know, whatever other avenue that they're not comfortable with going down or they're not trained in. So um, it's not the easiest to find that full integrative practitioner. I will admit um, I think there's, I don't need, I, I think there's only like 700 and something board certified functional neural in the chiropractic functional neurology worldwide or something to that effect. Wow. So, that's yeah, not a lot. <laughs> there's not a lot of us out there, but they do exist. So yeah, that acnb.org yeah. is a good website for that though. Oh, that's awesome. It really, it does take a village to get somebody well. Uh, it's never going to happen by just seeing one person because you got to work on it physically, emotionally, spiritually. You got to really, uh, you know, bake that cookie with all of its ingredients, not just one, exactly. right? Like you were talking yeah. about in the beginning. So how can people work with you? How can they find you? People who are listening and, and say, wow, I really want to see Dr. Barry. He sounds amazing. How do they find you? Well, definitely if they go to that website, the www.azchironeuro.com, that will give us all of our contact information. We had, we've put a ton of content on the website so that patients can read about different modalities, different things that we do. 
Um, our phone number is 480-756-2600. Um, for any of the practitioners out there that um, I do two day seminars worldwide and I will be on the road again. I'm heading to Arkansas tomorrow. Um, I'm going to be all over the United States and then Europe next year. Um, you know, Lord willing with Europe, I don't know how it's going to be with opening up with COVID. I'm planning, I'm supposed yeah. to be over there, but. Um, you were but supposed it, to go this fall, right? You were supposed yeah. to teach in Europe. Yeah. Got well, I was actually hoping to be at the Egyptian pyramids uh, for my <laughs> fall, but needless to say that got canceled. So, um, but if you go to Ericoni, that's E-R-C-H-O-N-I-A.com or Zymogen.com, the nutrition site or Vibrant.com, Vibrant Wellness, they should have my seminar series up there, but ericone.com will have, they, they're just about to post my 2021 schedule. So uh, definitely, and I get, because of my integrative approach, I get naturopaths, I get uh, MDs that are integrative, I get DCs, DOs, we get all kinds of, like acupuncturists, massage, it's really neat because it's a really global, like I get all kinds of, of healthcare providers attending the seminar. Oh, that's awesome. So you are in Arizona, where in Arizona are you? I'm uh, I'm in Chandler, Arizona. Sorry, I think I'm losing my internet connection a little bit here. Right. Uh, I'm in Chandler, Arizona, off off Ray and McClintock, just off the 101. So I'm in the Southeast Valley there, and uh, yeah, my uh, I've been so here. You're for, in the Phoenix area. Yeah, you're right These in the people Phoenix were going to fly in and fly to Phoenix. We do actually. That's one of our things. We treat. We get those intensives, so they fly in for a week or two weeks, and they just stay in our area. We've got lots of extended stay hotels near our clinic. And they'll fly in and get intensive rehab for a couple of weeks to get them that foundation set before we send them back home. So we definitely welcome that type of thing. Uh, we do telemedicine stuff too, as you're doing a lot. You know, we're doing a lot of online stuff as well too. So um, you know, I love I love everything that you're doing and getting this information out there. It's so amazing that because, like you said, we were talking before we went live that you know one of the hardest things about what you and I do is that just not enough people know about it. And I hear all the time, I'm like man, I wish I would have found you 15 or 20 practitioners <laughs> right. because, you know, this is kind of the answer yeah. to our prayers kind of thing. So, you know, and it, it's, you know, that's just something that we're humble about. We, we try and help everyone we can. We don't, we, we, you know, we don't hit home runs on every patient, but, you know, I always tell patients, you know, there's, if, if it's a neurological condition that's been not responding to everything else, there's a good chance our clinic's going to you know, be able to help you in some way, shape or form. So. Yeah. No, you guys do amazing work and I've, I've seen other patients come and go out of your clinic and I've had my own patients have seen you in the past. So I know you guys have a pretty good track record on, on fixing people that other people uh, don't know how to fix. So uh, for all the listeners, definitely check them out. Uh, again, their website is AZ Cairo Neuro and the website you can go to find a functional neurologist in your area is AC nb.org and you can put your zip code in and different functional neurologists will come up in your area or you can always fly in and see dr barry or one of the other physicians in his office um anyway i want to thank you so much for being with us today it's been uh, my pleasure and so much information and knowledge uh, that you shared with the listeners today so very thankful to have you on board today I am truly humbled. I thank you so much. I appreciate your energy. You know how much I appreciate you as well. And keep up the great work that you're doing to educate those and get that information out there. So I'm very blessed. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for being on today. Thanks, Doc. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Dr. Lottie, Science with Soul. Make sure you are subscribed so you will be notified of new episodes as they become available. To book a session with me or to sign up for a workshop or to see me as a physician, please visit drlottie.com or divinespiritualessence.com. My book, Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul, is available online at Amazon as well as other online platforms worldwide.